to PDC and thank you for spending what's going to turn out to be a very nice afternoon with us here indoors. And um, a special thank you to my fellow commissioners. Welcome to the May 8th, 2013 PDC Board of Commissioners meeting. Gina, please call the roll. Chair Andrews? Here. Commissioner Dixon? Absent. Commissioner Molis? Here. Commissioner Strauss? Here. Commissioner Wilhoyt? Here. And Commissioner Dixon should be joining us around 4 o'clock today. She couldn't make it. Uh, so we start with the uh, commissioner reports. Um, I had a couple of events. The Hispanic Chamber event was a, was a really good one. We've been making presentation, the regular presentations to city commissioners on budget items uh, and answering a, a lot of questions. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the opening of the Fields Park on Friday. And Commissioner Dixon will be representing PDC at that opening. It, it was open to the public on, on Monday and it's really spectacular. Um, you see a lot of smiles on people's faces down there today. Charles? Uh, not much to report, although Commissioner Dixon and I toured Convention Plaza on uh, Monday and uh, it's nice to see a project that's actually coming up and moving along and it looks like that's gonna be a very nice upgraded facility. Uh, beam management or beam development walked us through the project and I think it's five floors and has some nice views of this side of the river which is something you, you don't really think about too much but you go across the river and look back towards the west a very nice facility so looking forward to that project getting completed and the, that space getting filled up and activating that area of the city great Commissioner Strauss uh, we participated in that uh, trip to Japan and uh, I think we've made some good contacts there and appreciate the outreach that PDC is doing in that effort, so thank you. Commissioner Mullis. Well, thank you. Uh, I didn't get a chance to look at my calendar to refresh my memory before the meeting. <laughs> You've and been that all, busy. In all honesty, I haven't been outside of the walls of the Capitol very much over the last few months, so uh, I'll leave it at that. How are things going down there? They are progressing. Um, it's a little slower, um, but, but they're moving forward, so great. Executive Director Quinton. Thank you very much, Chair Andrews. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, got a few things to, uh, to report on uh, since our, our last meeting. The, f um, the first thing is, I think as everybody has probably read in the, in the paper, the, the mayor did uh, release his proposed budget uh, at the last week, beginning of last week, and as we expected, there were obviously cuts across many bureaus and so the mayor's proposed budget proposes to cut roughly a million dollars from our general fund allocation so general fund as everybody knows represents a, a small percentage of our overall budget but still a critical piece so um not you know it's it's not great news but but we understand that everybody has to kind of how to do their part and we we certainly appreciate the mayor's efforts to to produce a balanced budget with with uh, reserves and we still believe that we can maintain our our core programs that we fund with general fund with with the amount of money that was that was proposed by the mayor that that will of course still have to be approved by council we um we had a chance chair anderson had a chance to brief the mayor yesterday on our broader budget and we will be appearing before city council uh next week on the 15th for the first time to present the you know the full uh pdc budget the council sits as our budget committee and so they'll they'll hear the budget on the 15th they will vote on our budget on the 29th of may and then that uh, budget with any changes comes back to the pdc board at the end of june um as, you know goes to the to the tscc and then the board acts on it so budget um budget process is moving forward uh but it's obviously a tougher budget year uh than than we've had in the past um number of of events to, to to talk about that have happened and um, um, I mentioned some of these uh, at our last board meeting but I was had a chance to go to Atlanta uh, beginning of April April 9th through the 12th as part of our annual best practices trip a um, lot of interesting things going on in Atlanta they're borrowing a lot actually from from Portland putting in a streetcar line uh, making use of urban renewal to to activate a, a ring around around their city um, uh, the, the city um, 
uh, has a pretty large tourism and visitor industry, and so I know there were folks in our in our delegation who were very interested in how you know that how we, how we learn from from their experience and thinking about our convention center. But overall, once again, we you know, got to learn uh, what's working, what's not working, uh, and bring those lessons back to Portland. The following week, I had the opportunity really fun time, I have to say, um, gets me more fired up than just about anything else I get to do. We, I flew to Silicon Valley with five Portland startup companies, and we had arranged through the, through the work of our business and industry team, Jared Wiener in particular arranged most of this. We had arranged for, for them to meet with five different venture capital firms they got to present, and it was just great to, to be in the room and, and just, just, just they're, they're all kind of, as Commissioner Strauss would say, they're all rock stars, and I got to look just kind of be in the room and, and listen to them, great companies. And, and so part of what we're doing is helping these companies grow, access capital, but we're also selling Portland. And, and the reviews from the folks we met with were, uh, around Portland was, was great as well. So there's, that's, I think this is the beginning of future trips like this. And then we were also selling these um, uh, uh, venture f funds to make trips to Portland. And I think we might have one in, in the planning stages now. So, so that was great. Um, a couple of announcements on uh, on uh, expansions. Web Trends announced that they're they're moving their headquarters and uh, 225 employees to the the Big Pink Tower that was announced uh, a couple weeks back. That's a nice uh, statement about not just companies staying downtown, and we've, we're obviously seeing a lot of that, but um, companies actually staying within the the core downtown. To Big Pink is Unico is making an effort to to to. Uh, Upgrade a lot of these spaces to, to match the kind of the kind of open space that younger firms are looking for. So so that space that Web Trends took, I think, is is hopefully a trend that we'll see going into the future around some of the buildings and that are right downtown. And then within the uh, athletic and outdoor industry, we had um, a Switzerland-based company named On Footwear. They announced that they were opening their their headquarters in the Pearl. Uh, uh, um, a company called Amer Sports, which is a company that owns a number of brands, primarily in the in kind of the winter sports scene. They bought Solomon from Adidas a few years back, and they have Bonfire and and Atomic and other brands. So they've they've actually had a presence here in Portland, but they're expanding um, and relocating their design center to the Pearl as well, over on Northwest Twelfth. Uh, we had a, a role in that, and then um, um, a number of of the startup companies were honored at the Oregon Tech Awards at the end of the month. Uh, Cloudability, JanRain, Elemental Technologies, as well as Vesta, which is a stored value um, car, um, payment company. Uh, big, big turnout. A lot of great, once again, a lot of great companies um, were were profiled there. And then, you know, the big, the big news around the office of late has been the Startup PDX Challenge. Hopefully, you've been you've been reading about it, but. That, that challenge was, was we were soliciting applications from startups. They would be competing for $10,000 uh, in working capital, free space, and as well as a number of other services. We received 240 applications uh, beginning, it, it closed the beginning of April. We have whittled that list down to 16 uh, companies, 16, sweet 16 uh, around, and now all of those companies are online and we're having a public vote. So that vote that is happening as we speak, it closes tomorrow night, Thursday at midnight. Um, I'm gonna look at Sean. How many votes do we have so far? 9,000 9, votes so far. Wow. So that'll, that, that'll get us down to, uh, uh, to, a, to a smaller group and then we'll make a, a final selection of the final six that, that get selected for that. So um, I'm not gonna go through the list of companies, but a lot of great companies, most of them were local. Um, not all were tech. We did have some in the athletic and outdoor industry um, as well. But once again, if uh, well, anybody who's here in the audience, uh, if you haven't voted, go online and 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 vote. You can go to start at pdxchallenge.com until tomorrow night at midnight. We will announce the winners uh, on May 29th. And I mentioned this last time. I just want to reiterate: with 240 applications. We, have, we, we know that there are 240 startups out there that are looking for assistance, so we're going to follow up with all, all those companies, so it won't be just be the six companies that get selected for the, for the award. Um, uh, last week, we, we sent out our, our monthly 
PDC update. It's an email news digest. So if you haven't seen that, you can go find it on our on our website. But it it uh, it summarizes a lot of what's going on. A lot of things I just talked about. Uh, if you go to PDC.us, you can look under our headline section and see that that report. Um, I would like to to point out that included in that is is a link to our first annual report. We 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 put out. Um, progress reports on different strategies. We obviously have our annual budget, but since I've been with PDC over five years, we've never put out what what I typically see as an annual report, which is a summary of our 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 successes and our and our outputs, coupled with our audited financial statements. And so we now have that document. It's 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 for 1112 because that's the last year of our audited statements. Uh, but we will do this annually going forward, and um, we're making it available online. Right now, just to, to save printing costs, most people want to see things online, but we will have printed copies. But if you go to our website, once again, you can find our, our annual report. And it does feature about five or six, it does profile five or six companies or individuals that, that, that we helped during the 11-12 the fiscal year and, and uh, that represent the different kinds of work um, that we're doing. Just finally, some upcoming events uh, tomorrow. Awami uh, is having their, their annual uh, conference and trade show, and at that uh, luncheon, they're going to, PDC is going to receive the Public Agency Legacy Award, um, so I'll be able to receive that, um, that award on behalf of the board and all the staff at PDC. It's, it's a great honor, um, given our focus on minority entrepreneurship, so I'm um, looking forward to that. Um, next week is our, our annual International Business Awards Dinner on May 14th. That's Tuesday night at the Art Museum. You can, uh, once again, go to our website for those details. But the companies that are going to be honored, uh, we honor a host of companies every year. They include Asiana Airlines, AIMCO, which is a local manufacturer, uh, Adidas, and then Elemental Technologies again. Uh, we do this in, in, in uh, concert with the Oregon Consular Corps. And they have their own um, honorees. And those include Dean Robert Kloroff, um, and the Lewis and Clark Law School, uh, and Girding Edlin's Green Ambassador team will be honored by the Oregon Consular Corps. Um, next week, I head to, to Washington for 48 hours with the PBA and other business associations on their annual trip to, to meet with the delegation. We have a long list of issues that we want to talk about uh, with the delegation, the issues that are, um, that are important to us are the, the administration's focus uh, on funding export work, that's a big focus of ours, and, and we, we, we believe that, that we still need more federal funding of that work to, to make it a reality. Um, we want to make sure that the production tax credit rules are written um, and get out there soon so that the, the wind energy companies that are based here have, have clear direction on how to move forward with their projects. And then we're also going to um, try and talk about how to speed up the EB-5 approval process, which is a, uh, a program that attracts foreign investment capital in exchange for green cards, and there's been significant delays in getting those dollars to flow into our projects. And then lastly, I just want to remind everybody, on May 30th, we are having our North Northeast uh, Neighborhood Economic Summit uh, at the Convention Center. Uh, this is going to be a big event. Uh, we had our Fall uh, Neighborhood Summit in, in uh, East Portland at ERCO. This one is focused on North Northeast Portland. Uh, the mayor will be speaking there, and then we have Michael Bush uh, as our guest speaker from California who has a program called The Eight Factors, but he's a nationally recognized small business development expert. Uh, so we expect a big turnout. We had about 250 people at the fall summit, and this one uh, we hope will be just as big. Uh, you can go to our website uh, if you want more information on that, but uh, uh, we're definitely looking forward to that, that summit. No new hires or promotions to report uh, this month. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, just a couple of quick comments and try to draw this out because we're expecting a special guest well, here so, momentarily. I'm sorry, I can give you the update. We can go forward with the, with the presentation, and then he was going to testify after, oh, okay. the, um, Perfect. after the, the information item. Perfect. Um, I, I was just going to say I did. I went online and uh, and looked up the competition, and it's really interesting. Of this, all of the 16 companies, there's an outline uh, of of what they do, and once you vote, you can see how other people have voted. And it, 
there are three companies that are miles ahead of everybody else, and then everybody else is really kind of neck and neck. So uh, it's going to be fascinating to see how that comes out. <clears throat> and the other piece was just, uh, although this was a difficult budget process from the general fund standpoint, one of the interesting things that came out of it in our discussion with city council was they kept asking us, can you cut this program? Can you cut this program? And it was really an opportunity for us to show them how we have a, a very much a coordinated suite of, of products and opportunities that start with funding for startups, uh, entrepreneurship support, um, working capital, consulting for small businesses that don't know how to do marketing or can't handle the bookkeeping piece of it, uh, job, counsel, job and life counseling, all of the neighborhood support, um, uh, and then into the cluster strategy and some of the bigger projects. But uh, what we were able to do was to go back and tweak programs so that we maintain that breadth of services and take care of folks almost at, at any stage that they need to be versus you know, leaving a hole behind in the program somewhere. Um, so it was quite productive at the end. Yeah, of the we used, I think the message that we've continued to, to push forward is that we used the small amount of general fund to kind of get in the door with opportunities and we leverage that with, with our TIF. And so the, the, the small general fund dollars represent the way that we unlock the use of TIF, uh, larger amounts of TIF. So I think that message got across, so definitely. So, Commissioner Fish, would you like to make your presentation or would you like the presentation on Dawson to happen first? Perfect, I just didn't want to hold you up. So, uh, we're our two public comments for items tonight on the agenda. I don't have anyone signed up, so we will move right along to the regular agenda. Uh, it's an information item, it's Dawson Park project update. John Jackley. Scott, oh, I'm sorry. minutes? Yeah. Oh, minutes, I missed the minutes. Sorry, <laughs> hold on John. And I do have someone signed up. Okay, uh, let's back up to the meeting minutes of April 9th, 2013. I would look for a motion to approve. So moved. Are there any changes, additions, comments? I didn't find any this time. I'm gonna abstain since I wasn't at the meeting. You're gonna abstain? Yep. Okay. No changes. Uh, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? <laughs> Just making sure. All right, John. They corrected me. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, I'm John Jackley, Manager of the Neighborhood Division at PDC. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to bring the Dawson Park project uh, to you today. As the agenda indicates, uh, I'll provide a brief overview of the project, some of the innovative approaches. Uh, Commissioner Fish uh, will join uh, me up here uh, for a significant announcement regarding the uh, park project. Uh, then, as the agenda indicates, uh, after the information item, uh, you will uh, adjourn the PDC meeting, reconvene as a local contract review board, make findings in support of alternative contracting. One of the innovations here is that it's, it's not a low-bid contract, and I'll go into some details there. Then you reconvene as PDC to take an action item to authorize the executive director to execute the contract. But this will be one overview presentation uh, on the project itself, and we appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Dawson Park, as you know, uh, is a two-acre park in central northeast Portland. It was purchased in 1921. Uh, Portland Parks and Recreation Bureau calls it one of the top historically significant parks in the entire city. Uh, historically, it's been a center of Portland's African-American community. It was the site of Robert F. Kennedy's campaign visit here during his presidential campaign. Uh, many civil rights activities, marches, uh, protests, uh, civil rights uh, things uh, were both launched and took place in the park uh, in the 1960s through the 1980s. The, gaze the gazebo dome in the park uh, was renovated from a 2008 uh, PDC grant, and that came from one of the cornerstones of the uh, former Albina Commercial District. And as a result, uh, there's an extreme importance of, of the park 
making sure that the innovative approaches uh, re reflect the history, the community interest, and, and the passion that just everybody feels uh, about the quality of the park. Uh, we've also developed a number of innovations on this, on this project. Uh, number one, uh, because the design, which was done in an extremely collaborative fashion with the North Northeast community, but there was a time lag between the time that the Citizens Committee uh, reached consensus on the design and when the uh, park project began to get operational. So we have been working with uh, the noted community outreach person, Joan Brown Klein, uh, to kind of refresh the churches, the neighborhood organizations, the civic groups, and the citizens about the park and the schedule. Uh, we have hired an outside construction project management firm with extremely close ties to the community, and I'll invite them up uh, at the end of this presentation to see if you have any, to introduce them and see if you have any questions. Uh, we're doing highly focused, very targeted subcontractor outreach through the Metropolitan Contracting uh, Improvement Partnership to ensure that we maximize the opportunities for women and minority-owned firms to participate on the project. Uh, also following your direction, uh, this is not a low bid project, uh, but it is a best value guaranteed maximum price contract in which price is important, but it will also include experience, the team, uh, the track record for using certified firms and other value-based things like that. And then finally, this project uh, will be subject to the new, uh, more stringent equity policy that the board approved in January and which uh, Executive Director Quentin has issued some guidelines subsequent to that. So there's been a lot of uh, public conversation about the park. Uh, I won't read every milestone, but you can see that it's been in the works for quite some time. Uh, the involvement uh, led by the Parks Bureau has been thorough. It's been inclusive. Uh, it's been very open. I was struck at a meeting last month uh, that I attended between the Parks Bureau and the African American Alliance. People were laughing. There was all kinds of contributions. The Bureau was uh, really open and responsive to some suggestions that the community made. And that's why I think everyone is going into this project with such a, uh, a lot of energy, a lot of passion, uh, and a lot of very uh, good feeling. The project team uh, sought stories by local residents to be reflected in the artwork, in the plaques, and in the surrounding plaza seating. Some of the highlights of the, uh, the project, uh, they wanted, we want to restore Dawson Park as a key neighborhood gathering space. Uh, we want to increase diversity uh, in contracting. Uh, the overall budget is about $2.1 million. Uh, 350000 of that is in soft costs, including project management, uh, the rest in hard costs. Uh, we have a great team. I think one of the reasons why we're going into this project, into the construction part of it with such momentum and good feeling and connections with the community is because of the way the team has come together. Uh, from Portland Parks and Recreation, uh, it's Kia Selly. You'll remember her as a longtime uh, PDC manager. Uh, Sandra uh, Bertzos, who's kind of their day-to-day -day project manager for the, uh, for the project. On the PDC side, it's uh, Dave Oburn, who you know, Dan Spiro, the professional services manager. Carol Hertzberg in the neighborhood division is the day-to-day -day, uh, project manager. And Sarah King, <coughs> excuse me, in the neighborhood division is the project sponsor. Another key highlight is uh, the scheduling. We've been able to stage the construction so that the park will be able to remain open this summer and next summer as well. We'll be able to do the, we'll split the construction between fall and early spring. There's some design highlights uh, that I think are, oh, there we go, uh, that are worth pointing out. Uh, one of the central design goals was to make the park more welcoming, more active. And then, of course, uh, it was crucial to honor the park's history and the community connections in a very, very visible way. The renovated park will include an expanded playground with all new equipment, uh, new path lighting, and thinning out of some of the current dense tree canopy. There'll be new and updated amenities, such as picnic tables, barbecues, performance space. Uh, and then there'll be a, uh, an additional feature that I'll, uh, I'll wait for Commissioner uh, Fish to announce. There's also some key elements that stand out in the project. Uh, the new plaza uh, will have a, a larger, sunnier plaza space. Uh, there'll be an interactive uh, water feature to draw families out. Uh, there'll be enhanced performance space. Uh, this will allow ADA access, which the park currently uh, does not provide right now. And there'll be more performer audience interaction. As you know, the summer concerts are extremely popular at Dawson Park. So we're looking forward to that as well. 
Uh, there's also new public art on the project. Uh, the public artist, Isaka Shamsuddin, is designing 14 cast stone medallions to be placed in a decorative fence surrounding the playground. These medallions are two-sided. On the interior, there's brightly colored geometrics inspired by traditional African village design. And on the exterior, there's historical depictions of African American culture in Northeast Portland. These themes include uh, music, athletics, religious life, community connections. And uh, 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 Parks Bureau, again, was extremely uh, open and welcoming to the African American Alliance and to the community contributions on the nature of the stories and how they should be depicted. And again, that gives us a lot of momentum going into the, uh, into the project. Here's just one example of how uh, some of the interpretive engravings will look. Uh, and these will be on custom-made uh, boulders surrounding the water feature. Uh, the schedule, uh, like I said, is uh, uh, on track. Uh, with your approval and direction, the construction RFP will be issued in May. Uh, we'll make the contractor selection in July. The RFP will be awarded in August. Notice to proceed in September 2013 and construction complete in the spring of 2014. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, I, I mentioned some of these. Uh, we're really placing a premium on both uh, prime contractor outreach for the RFP and also uh, on the sub side. Uh, we're going to aid potential subs uh, with technical assistance, uh, the, uh, reading bid docs, finding specs. We'll have the drawings at MCIP, at NAMAC, at other places so uh, subs can come in at, uh, at off hours uh, to be able to see what the project looks like. Uh, and the final result will be a guaranteed maximum price construction contract which will lock in an upfront construction price and avoid multiple change orders uh, with which we are all too often familiar on some projects in the past. So before concluding the presentation, uh, I'd like to introduce and maybe ask up uh, Carl Schultz and Patty Miles from Inisi. Uh, this is the architectural and project management firm uh, that was uh, hired through a competitive process to manage the project. Uh, Ms. Miles will be the day-to-day -day construction project manager supervising the prime contractor and being the air traffic controller for the project. And Mr. Schultz is the principal who will be overseeing it from their end. Good. With your permission, I'd like to ask Please. Uh, Carl and Patty to come on up, uh, introduce you to the board, and see if the board has any questions uh, about the firm. Uh, NEC has done many large signature uh, projects in Portland uh, that you all are familiar with. Uh, Ms. Miles actually grew up down the street from Dawson Park, uh, went off to become an architect in St. Louis and has worked at different cities around the country and is back to Portland working on this and other projects. Great. So, Welcome and thank you. We're looking forward to seeing this long-awaited project get going. So, Do you want to talk about your approach just real briefly? Or? Sure. Um, <laughs> obviously, uh, thank you. I'm sure there's many of you I know. Um, appreciate the opportunity to work with PDC and the city on this project. Um, we believe in a teamwork philosophy, um, helping both all the team members be successful and uh, deliver a project as needed on time and under budget. So our goal is to make sure that everyone on the team achieves the success and not um, in some jurisdictions, sometimes like uh, look at the negative side. Our goal will to support the teammates, the contractor, the design team to make sure that everything meets the goal of the community and the project meets the intent. Well, it's a very special project for me personally, growing up in the neighborhood and born at a legacy and went to a Macklin Heart for my early years. So it's kind of nice to have a chance to take part in uh, the, the changes going on in the neighborhood and to revitalize the park, so I'm excited. Great, thank you. And I think I'd point out um, that m under most circumstances, we would probably have a staff person acting as a project coordinator. Um, but with our, our both our downsizing and the special nature of this particular project, we thought it would be much more efficient to hire someone with the correct skill base for this particular project and do it on a contract basis. Super, thank you so much. Yeah. That concludes the presentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any questions you all Charles, have? you want to start? Well, I just had a couple, and obviously I'm as thrilled as anyone to see the, the uh, project uh, coming to fruition. I've been here, what, seven or eight years now on the commission, and we've talked about things that we'd like to do in the community and that we've wrestled with the availability of resources all around the city. 
and that when you look at building community, you look at projects that the community can, can embrace. And this is the type of project I think this community really uh, is looking forward to embracing. So I'm very happy to see it on the map and uh, coming to reality. As far as the project itself, uh, and I think, John, you touched on this, but the changes that are being proposed, how much of that was really driven by the community uh, in getting to the design that we're talking about creating at the park? Well, I think it was an organic process. Uh, uh, the Parks Bureau uh, has been uh, touching bases with the community and working with them since 2007. Uh, I think there was extensive community solicitation into the design itself. Uh, there were drafts back and forth. There was a continual conversation between the stakeholders, the designers, and the Parks Bureau. Uh, at that point, PDC wasn't involved in the project other uh, than as the, uh, the, the funder of it. Uh, but I think the, what you see in front of you is that uh, the, the Parks Bureau and the, uh, the architects incorporated the values that the, communities wanted, the community wanted to see instilled, which was the history, the historic role of the African American community, uh, to make it welcoming, to make it very family and very uh, child friendly, to make it even better for the popular concert series. Uh, so the, the design elements uh, are reflected in, in the specs, in the drawings, and, and I think that's why the community's been so supportive of it. And obviously we can't have everything we want, um, but is there anything that uh, was loudly expressed as being absent from, from what we're proposing doing here? No. 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 Okay. And I think with Commissioner Fish's announcement, you'll see the, uh, the crowning jewel piece fall into place. I'm asking these questions to build up to this climactic. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, lastly, is there anything in the design that we're looking at right now that causes us any concern? And John, you hit the nail on the head. You know, we're faced with limited resources. We can't have changes in costs that are surprises. Is there any feature in here that, uh, that uh, causes any big question marks with regard to our ability to complete it and, and deliver it on cost? No, Commissioner. No. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Strauss. Spectacular project, and we're very excited to get going on it. One of the things that this commission has been very proud of is our participation of women-owned businesses, small businesses, and minorities in projects that have that the PDCs participated in. Uh, this project specifically was identified as one we wanted to see as the poster child for participation of small businesses, women-owned businesses, and minority businesses. How can we make sure that we exceed all metrics that we could possibly imagine? And, and really give back to the community in the biggest of ways. And how, is, how, how can you ensure that's gonna happen? Uh, Commissioner, I'll start with that, and then uh, if, if Carl and Patty wanna jump in. Uh, a, a number of ways. Uh, first of all, uh, this project will be subject to the new, more stringent equity policy that you all approved in January. So it allows us to set very aggressive goals. Uh, we have uh, uh, outreach mechanisms in place, such as our flexible services contract with the Metropolitan Contractors Improvement Partnership. Uh, we also learned a lot on the fields project. If you recall, that's one in which PDC participated heavily uh, in the selection process. Uh, they actually picked a minority prime. That project came in on time and on budget, so we've got a, a track record uh, of learning both on the fields. Plus, we have PDC's historical average uh, of about 33% use of certified firms, uh, with minorities being number one. Uh, women-owned firms, number two, ESBs, uh, a third. Uh, so every year it's roughly a third and a third and a third, but over the course of time, uh, certified minority firms have been number one. So we have both our, our own expertise, our track record. Uh, there's a tremendous interest in the community. I think the fact that it's, a, uh, a uh, in essence, an RFP uh, instead of a low bid uh, will prove advantageous to community-based firms. Uh, also, uh, unlike many uh, projects, both public and private, uh, we're providing uh, just about a two-month response period for the RFP. So that, that means that smaller primes who might be interested uh, would have plenty of time to do whatever work they're doing and then still plan for the project itself. So we're confident that we will not only meet, uh, but will exceed uh, PDC's, uh, not just our 20% our goal that's in the policy, uh, but our historic percentage levels that are in the 30s. And that includes the workforce side as well as the contracting side. Oh, we've talked in the past about looking to the community for um, 
contributions to these types of projects, whether it's memorial benches or naming of the fountain or some of those things? Um, has that process begun? Will the project managers help us with that? Obviously, with legacy health systems there, they, they, they're close, they've got to be interested. I'm certainly interested in contributing. I think there's other people on the board here that are contributing, people in the audience that want to contribute. So um, what can be done to get contributions to really enhance this park? Uh, Commissioner, the answer is yes, but I'm going to defer to Commissioner Fish's announcement before I answer that question in full. <laughs> Thanks for setting the tee a little higher. <laughs> better. And, it's and, going to be so high he's going to whiff. <laughs> and then the last question is, uh, you know, I'm very passionate about sustainable design and sustainability. Uh, what sustainable design measures are going to be incorporated? Obviously, uh, uh, because the park uses such little energy, it's an opportunity for a net zero energy park, or, or are you thinking along those lines at all? Uh, the park in, uh, the park design incorporates a number of sustainable features uh, from uh, from the plumbing. Uh, I think there's some limited solar. Um, I may, if you if you want a design answer, I may ask uh, someone from Parks to come no, up. No, I think as long as it's got it's been covered, I think that's Absolutely. fabulous. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Mullis. Well, thank you, and I, I think it's worth noting that this is the first time we've uh, tried to use this style of contract here at PDC, and I, I think this uh, project is, is an appropriate place to start uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the project. It, it really seems like it's been well vetted with the community and well thought out, and uh, you know, we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, I know before we go any further, you want to call up uh, Kia and... Commissioner Fish, but before we do that, so I don't forget, I just want to say to you, thank you so much for another great presentation. You are always so organized and so clear, and your projects are always so good at meeting the, the organization's goals with regard to the equity piece, but also knowing how important um, we have not had real good experience, especially with parks with the low bid. Uh, and, and your comment tees up the next piece of this agenda is we're going to adjourn and come back as a local contract board because we have to by law because this is an exception to the normal practice. Um, but it, it, it's such an important exception, I don't see a problem in doing it. But um, fa fantastic job as always, John. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, how about our other two guests before we go further? And, and, and I just want to tell my commissioners, when I sit in front of Commissioner Fish, he doesn't hold back, so. <laughs> Did I mention I'm a little under the weather today? <laughs> <laughs> Let me defer to Kia, and then I'll, I'll go second. Hello, Kia. Oh, so I'll do this one. Well, do you want me to just go there? Yeah, so I'll do that one. So maybe I will go first. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, Patrick and his team, thank you for the honor of testifying today. You also got me out of a city hall hearing <laughs> I was dragging, but I appreciate the chance uh, to be here. And it's been a while since I had a chance to visit with you, so I have three things I'd like to say today. The first is a big thank you for your service to the city. You have one of the toughest jobs in our community, particularly during a time of downsizing and uh, um, a big sort of rethink of the core mission of the Portland Development Commission. Um, and it gives me great confidence as we go through this exercise that we have such a high quality people serving on this commission and serving this community. So let me begin by just thanking you for your service, each and every one of you. The second is uh, I wanna just celebrate uh, one of our most successful collaborations, which was the completion of the Fields Park in the River District, and it's a nice segue to what we're gonna be talking about with Dawson Park. Our newest park in one of our newest neighborhoods. And a wonderful example of the collaboration which exists between city bureaus and the Portland Development Commission, in this case, Portland Parks and Rec and PDC. I was uh, with Director Abate Monday morning uh, as the fences were being removed, and I'm a little bit of a history buff, so if you'll forgive me for a moment, I stood there at 7.30 as all the hard hats arrived and they were moving down the fences and I, I had everyone stop and I pointed to the fences and I said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that fence. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure anyone got that, but uh, the, the humor in that, there was work to be done. But we tore down the fence and, um, and all of a sudden, uh, young moms with kids that were 
going to the alternative school on the other side of the park and people who lived in the adjacent condo and older adults walking their dogs uh, converged on the park. And it is a absolutely splendid, beautiful addition to our gold medal system. But it's another wonderful example of the way we work so well together. So heartfelt thank you for all that you did and particularly Commissioner Strauss for setting the bar, the highest bar we've ever had in terms of MWESB participation uh, on that particular project. Um, and I think it's a good segue to what's before you today, which is the redesign of an older park in one of our most historic neighborhoods in, in, uh, in our Northeast. Um, this project is, is very important to me personally. And uh, as you know, for the last uh, four and a half years, I've had the honor of serving as a commissioner in charge of Portland Parks and Rec. I'm, I'm, co I'm currently commissioner um, in winter, what does that say? In waiting, in winter, something like that. There's a little hiatus period, so, uh, but um, this is something that I care about deeply. It's something that the uh, Bureau cares about deeply. And uh, there has, uh, staff has done a wonderful job. John's done a wonderful job laying the foundation for your consideration. I want to use this moment also, though, to acknowledge the contribution of our dear friend, departed friend, Harold Williams. Because early on in this process, we engaged Harold to help us better understand the history of the site and to collect those stories that John referred to. And may God rest his good soul. But he was integral for us in building a bridge to the community and making sure that this project was of the community. It wasn't something that just we wanted to transplant to the community. Um, the design speaks for itself the care that's gone into making sure that there's the maximum amount of opportunity for community members and, and disadvantaged groups speaks for itself. But frankly, there was a missing piece to this design uh, when it was uh, finalized. And that's what my announcement is all about today. As you know, last year, Legacy Emanuel Medical Center opened the Randall Children's Hospital, which is not only a spectacular building designed by one of our local distinguished architect firms, but it's just an amazing addition to that healthcare complex. This year, Legacy Emanuel Medical Center is celebrating their centennial. And what better way to further strengthen the relationship between that distinguished medical provider and the community it serves. And so thanks to their generosity in the form of a $200,000 grant to this project, there will be one element, Commissioner Strauss, that had been penciled out because of cost that is now penciled back in, and that will be the Legacy Children's Fountain. So a round of applause to our friends at Legacy. There is a small gap that has to be made up, which Parks is pleased to contribute in the form of systems development charges. And these are uh, systems development charges are well suited to these kinds of uh, enhancements to our community. But I think it speaks a lot to the values of Dr. Lori Morgan and to her dynamic sidekick, Pamela Witherspoon, who we work with so regularly on community matters, that they stepped up and saw an opportunity in their centennial year to cement a relationship to the community through this park. So we're very pleased and proud that they have invested in what we think will be a signature interactive children's fountain. And just think about the symmetry, that as families come to meet with their loved ones and their children in one of the great medical centers in the country, uh, they can leave the building and walk down a dedicated pathway to a beautiful park and an interactive children's fountain. It is a benefit not only to the people they serve, but to the broader community. Dawson Park has a wonderful history, and we honor that history, I believe, with this proposal. And I think we also honor the terrific relationship that we enjoy as two agencies. So I'm here to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a tough act to follow. Yes, it is. You thought I was going to whiff. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> maybe, I, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm going to whiff. <laughs> no, you're the A team here. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Chair Andrews and Commissioners. My name is Kia Selly. I am the Portland Parks and Recreation Planning, Design, and Asset Manager. I'm here today on behalf of the Parks Director, Mike Abate. Portland Parks and Recreation is very pleased to be a partner with the Portland Development Commission for the renovation of this park. The new park design has been shaped, as we've talked about, um, based on extensive community input, 
and it will truly reactivate the park and celebrate its history as an important center for Portland's African American community. As the commissioner was mentioning um, earlier today, Portland Parks and Recreation and Portland Parks Foundation announced the Legacy Emanuel Health Center gift for the fountain. This new park element in particular will be a vital part of the park's reactivation. It will really engage the community and its children more deeply. Parks is very supportive of PDC taking the lead on construction of the park. PDC's innovative approach to construction contracting will help ensure completion of a very high quality park for the best price while also increasing diversity in the contracting workforce. So thank you again for your significant contribution um, in, of funding for the renovation of this park and for your leadership in the construction of the park. We really look forward to starting construction this fall. Thank you. So uh, before I let the other commissioners ask the really tough questions, uh, I, I want to start by actually thanking you, Commissioner Fish. Um, we have worked very closely for the last four years, starting with the merger of the Housing Bureau, um, which is never a, an easy exercise. Sixty-five of our employees went over and went to work for the city, uh, and there were systems that had to change, and uh, a lot of work had to go into that. But I think it's been super successful, uh, super successful because I think it's more efficient and quite frankly, super successful because it took off of our agenda uh, a big hunk of what we were dealing with on a monthly basis. And we we're able to focus on economic development like we never were before. And it was absolutely the perfect time for that to happen. Um, we've also had an opportunity to, to uh, uh, reaffirm the 30% set aside, which again, uh, it had only been in place for five years. City Council agreed that it was time to look for it. It could have been a nasty, contentious, not fun process, uh, and it was anything but that. Um, and I think everybody was satisfied with the result. It was, it's moved on very, very smoothly, and it's been really interesting updating the new members of the City Council as to how it works and why we are where we are today. But it's, it's. Uh, We've had a, a great relationship, and, and uh, I, I look forward to that in the future. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair Andrews, for those kind words. There were many skeptics when we went down that path four years ago. And if I can just loosely quote Ron Wyden, I had a full head of hair and there was no gray, I think, when we started that. <laughs> but um, there were many skeptics, and um, I appreciate the fact that you and the Commission stayed true to the vision, and, that, and, and what we understood then was we could only be successful if we deepened the collaboration because even with the change, you are still primarily responsible custodian of the 30% uh, funds that, 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 that allow us to do this work. And so for this to be successful, while there was a separation and a consolidation, there was also a deepening of the partnership. And I'm very appreciative of your leadership and the team. And every time I see you at City Hall, we're always joking about where you find time for your day job. Uh, but you do a marvelous job, and we thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Good to see you. The Parks is lucky to have you. you. You did a great job here, and we were so happy that you were able to find another place that you could be so helpful at, at the city level. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to this side this time. Well, thanks, Commissioner Fish and Kia, both for being here today and, and for your leadership. And I'll just second uh, uh, Scott's comments about the, you know, the good partnership in, in numerous areas, uh, parks and housing. Um, I got to take a, a tour of the, uh, the new children's hospital uh, right before it, it opened, and, and it is a, a marvelous facility. And so to have this park, you know, be redone um, in the way that the community has visioned it is really going to be a nice tie. It's, it's going to be tremendous. So, and Commissioner Mollis, you know, when we, I, I might have been on the same tour one shortly after you took, and I, you know, for those of us who have children and who have children that have had health challenges, one of the innovations of their program, which touched me deeply, was the way they designed the uh, patients' rooms to accommodate families, mm -hmm. specifically designed so that a mom or a dad and a brother or sister could sleep overnight in the same suite with the patient. And for those of us who've gone through the experience of a child in a hospital setting, I just think that is a, is a huge breakthrough and leap forward in terms of keeping families together while they're going through the strain of medical procedures, and, and that's 
that's the least of it. I mean, the quality of the doctors, the, the, the passion of the, the professionals who work there, but it really is an innovative part of what they've done, and we're appreciative of them very much. Commissioner Strauss? <clears throat> uh, no comments, just thank you. We appreciate the partnership. We really do, and appreciate the opportunity to work with you. So. Very nice. I thought you were going to ask us about the underground parking. We were going to apologize. Oh, right. We didn't. We didn't have the budget for it, but we we could always revisit that question. <laughs> we did. <laughs> uh, now you still have to remember that you can't eat the soil. There you go. <laughs> well, thanks, Commissioner Fish. Always a pleasure to uh, be in your presence and hear from you. And Kia, good to see you back. Uh, I'm I'm sitting here a little conflicted, being so closely aligned with another. Uh, healthcare institution and hearing all these <laughs> glowing things uh, stated about legacy. But, uh, you know, they have great leadership under Dr. Brown and OHSU and legacy have strong affiliation. And uh, that just speaks to uh, what we are all about in Portland, I think, and in Oregon. It is about cooperation. And this is a, as uh, uh, Chair Andrew stated, poster child type of a project that shows, uh, though sometimes things take time to come about, Sometimes you hit a home run, and this is a home run. So thank you for all of your cooperation. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I've been here for a little while, as I stated earlier, working with you and the rest of the commissioners and the mayor's office. Generally, everyone tries to do the right thing. And uh, sometimes it takes a while, but when we get to the end result, uh, I think everyone is rewarded and, and everyone is appreciative of all the time and effort. And I think once this uh, renovation is completed. Uh, we will hear nothing but glowing things about it for decades to come. So thanks for all the effort, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. If I could just close, Mr. Chair, with a, um, I neglected to give adequate credit to the Portland Parks Foundation and Nick Hardig for their role. They are the uh, partner of the Bureau that raises substantial private funds to help augment our work. And as you know, at a time of uh, lean budgets, we cannot be successful without, without great private partners. And, and we get uh, millions of dollars every year that comes to us to help us do our work. So thanks to Nick Hardig and the foundation. We have 120 um, active friends and partner groups that help us deliver our services. So that, that's the essence of public-private partnership. And the other thing I'll mention about Dawson is uh, we run a program called Summer Free For All every year, free movies, concerts, rock climb swims throughout our city in every neighborhood. And one of the most successful programs, which has historically been funded in part by Legacy, is at Dawson. And some of the great jazz people in our backyard perform there in the summertime and bring community together. So it's all good, and I, I can't wait for this uh, redesign to be completed and for us to all celebrate the rebirth of this historic park. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, normally we'd be have some sort of a motion to approve a contract, but because of this exception, we actually, uh, this is an informational item that now we are going to um, adjourn as the Portland Development Commission. Thank you guys so much, and we'd love to have you stay, but know that you, you also have a day job. Uh, so the meeting of the Portland Development Commission is now adjourned. The members of the Portland Development Commission and will now meet as the Commission's local contract review board consider the next item on the agenda. That item is resolution 7002, making findings in support of exempting the Dawson Park Improvement Project from competitive bidding. Welcome and good afternoon. Dan and David. Good afternoon, Chair. This is fun. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Andrews, members of the board, uh, Executive Director of Clinton. My name is Dan Spiro, and I'm the Professional Services Manager for PDP. Uh, in that role, I oversee PDP contracting and procurement activities. Uh, I'm going to go immediately off script and just say this is the first time I've been before the board. I would be lying if I said I was not a little nervous. <laughs> I hope you will bear with me. Uh, on behalf of the project team, I am pleased to bring this item before you. Oh, that's a little different, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, on behalf of the project team, I am pleased to bring this item before you. Uh, in it, we are seeking approval from the PDC Board of Commissioners in your role as the local contract review board uh, to exempt the Dawson Park Improvement Project from a standard low bid competitive process. Uh, as part of this presentation, I'm going to walk through some of the statutory background and some of the requirements that are required of the, the board and the LCRB. Uh, and Dave Oburn, Construction Environmental Services Manager, will talk about the pilot project itself. 
So as you know, um, public improvement projects uh, under Oregon law are, uh, usually follow a low bid process. Uh, any contract that is not a low bid contract is considered an alternative contract. Uh, ORS uh, 279 allows agencies to deploy a pilot projects to try out new uh, contracting methods that they have not tried before. This is uh, to see if there's other ways we can work and other different ways we can approach contracting. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, in order to exempt a public improvement contract from a low bid process, uh, the local contract review board rules, administrative rules, require three things. They require um, written findings. You can find those in the staff report for this resolution. It uh, requires that we hold a public meeting and invite public comments. Uh, and it also requires the LCRB to authorize the action to go, go forth. Uh, as I mentioned, the findings are attached in your materials. Uh, we held a meeting. Um, actually, we published the findings on March 6th. We held a public meeting on March 20th. Uh, we received no comments, and we had no attendees at the meeting. Um, no comments, uh, as you can find the report. I think that is all I have to say about the kind of the statutory uh, background. Uh, and I will turn it over to Dave to talk about the pilot project. Good afternoon, Dave Oburn, uh, Construction Environmental Services Manager. I just want to echo on uh, Dan's presentation on the innovative pilot project. We, of course, uh, work very closely with Dan's team, looking at multiple different alternative contracts. I'm constantly watching that. Obviously, through years past with the board here, we've done a number of alternative contracts. I've done design build, CMTC, two-step, et cetera, for various projects. Generally, there are larger development projects that are five, ten million dollars. So, for example, Station Place Garage was an example of an alternative contract that the board authorized a number of years ago. Um, as part of that, we tried to look at how could we try something maybe new and different here at Dawson. So after a considerable review, um, we've uh, picked up on a best value selection process that's beginning to be deployed not only here in Oregon, but many other places around the country here. And that considers a number of other key evaluation factors rather than just traditionally uh, low bid. So we look at other things like experience, capability, quality, performance, technical experience, and obviously also we can look at goals around equity and other um, items that are important for this uh, project. So we think with that combination of a best value approach and selection and then locking that in under a guaranteed maximum price will help us achieve the best of project goals. As you well know, unfortunately, I've had to come for in front of you many times before. It's usually after the project's uh, gone a little under the water here. And perhaps uh, I'd like the opportunity for with the agency to try something else out and see if it really is successful. Um, one of the reasons we did pick this project too albeit it is uh, 1.7 million in size, in relative scale for alternatives, it's fairly small. The good part about doing a small pilot is if it doesn't work, the worst case is then we're not going to be, again, just way underwater. My belief is I think it will work, and then that way we have an ability to learn on a smaller one, and then as we move forward in the future, we can adapt the things we have learned into future um, projects here with PDC. Um, obviously, as part of your staff packet, I provided a report earlier on, I think it was back in January, to the executive director on uh, various uh, background information on best value. So um, as a kind of follow-up as part of the end of our presentation, after the project is complete, so that'll be summer of next year, we're required by statute to come back to the board to give you a report on actually the success and or failures of this effort. So obviously you're hearing a lot of, let's just call it all the good things right now. We will come back with the actual nitty gritty once we're done with the project. Typically what we do, we do an entire owner's team debrief meeting. I did that on Waterfront Park, for example, and that way we collect everybody's input on that, and then we come back to the board um, with a report. So that'll be in the summer of next year after um, the project is complete. So um, at this point, uh, as part of the process, Chair, um, 
the board needs to open up for any other public comment, then obviously um, you could move ahead to adopt uh, the findings and uh, the resolution to exempt uh, this project from competitive bidding. Okay, um, I don't have anyone signed up for testimony, but if there, we'll make sure that there isn't anyone here that would like to. Um, if not, I, I guess what I'd like to say is the, the, there was three points brought out in our packet in terms of the legal requirements. The first were the findings in the public meeting, which, which took place. The second was that it's unlikely that the exemption will encourage favoritism in the awarding of a public contract or substantially dim diminish competition for the contract. And I'm satisfied that the process that we're using and the outreach that we are providing, which is even beyond what we normally do, satisfies that. And uh, Eric, tell me if I'm wrong. The, the third one, though, is the awarding of the contract and the exemption will result in a substantial cost savings to the agency. And that is really covered by the fact that this is a we're this is a pilot program, and we will get reports, frankly, on both of these two facts, 30 days afterwards. Um, but we're we. Will be the report that comes back. Okay, at the Perfect. at the end of the project. Well, trust me, we'll hear if people think that we've encouraged favoritism, or <laughs> probably before then. Um, so that's all I had, Charles. No, I think that those are the critical factors. Since this is a pilot, something we have not done. Uh, obviously, you have to take the step. Me, or I think going through all the due diligence we need to to make sure that we're approaching it in the right way. We're going to report back on it, and then we will see where we end up. And the objective, of course, is to estimate the right cost, negotiate the right price, get it done at that maximum price, and then have that information available for us to use this in the future with the right type of project. So I don't have any questions. Steve? I think it's a spectacular way to contract for the project and to achieve the goals that we're looking for. Uh, the significant risk that I see in the project is the fountain. Those historically have been um, problematic in projects. How will the contract allow us to uh, minimize the risk there? Is there any opportunities to have extended warranties or anything along those lines? A uh, couple things I can mention on that. And if you recall, we had a much more complex fountain that I deployed with Parks Department, Waterfront Park. So I would say the good part is we always learn through these parks since then has deployed a number of, let's call it water features. It'll be a much different scale, by the way, than Waterfront Park. So. But as part of that, so we, as part of the contract, we do have requirements for commissioning and startup to really make sure that we've really fully debugged that uh, part of the um, project element. And I feel pretty confident with that, along with a two-year warranty, that we're going to meet the success uh, of that feature. Okay. Super. John? Well, I think I might have made my comments premature <laughs> in the meeting when I said this was the appropriate project for it, and I believe it is. And I, and I think the outreach that, that John Jackley and his team spoke to earlier uh, will ensure that we have uh, lots of participation. And then as a pilot, we'll step back afterwards and, and see what we've done. But if it's properly managed and there's not change orders and there's not tear outs, that's a savings as well. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so I would look for a motion to approve resolution 7002, making findings in support of and exempting the Dawson Park Improvement Project from competitive bidding. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. So now we uh, will adjourn as the Commission's local contract review board and the meeting of the Portland Development Commission is reconvened, and we go back to what we would normally have done 15 minutes ago, which was vote on the project itself. John, anything? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, we don't have a separate presentation on this. Right. Uh, I think we've given you the outlines of, uh, of how uh, we recommend proceeding on this. But we're here to answer any questions you might have about uh, the contract itself, the RFP, the process, or anything else you might want. Any any further questions from the board? I think I think we covered them all. So I would look for 
Motion to approve resolution 7003, authorizing the executive director to execute a best value guaranteed maximum price contract not to exceed $1,775,000 for construction of the Dawson Park improvements in the interstate corridor urban renewal area. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Can't wait to see the opening. So. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you. Appreciate John. it. Thank you. Um, why don't we take a five minute break and give so it a move?
this presentation. Um, we were audited, as the board well knows, uh, by the city auditor back in December, and I thought that there were some fantastic facts that uh, were part of that report that, <clears throat> frankly, had not really seen much of the light of day. And I wanted to make sure that both we had an opportunity to celebrate them and perhaps maybe make them a little bit more obvious to the rest of the world. So with that, Mr. Barnes. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Chair Andrews, Commissioners, Executive Director Quinn. I'm Tony Barnes, Budget Officer of TDC. Uh, today I'm going to provide a quick uh, brief look at how property value is growing inside urban renewal areas compared to the rest of the city. So while there are many variables impacting the growth of value, it is clear that the investments made uh, using tax increment financing in a lot of districts have helped facilitate greater growth. And in most URAs, by uh, establishing the necessary infrastructure and uh, providing the incentive for private development that otherwise may not have occurred. So my report's gonna look at a couple different methods of looking at value. Um, one, we're gonna look at what the city auditor's report um, reviewed, which was uh, included in the report as an attachment and it's based on real market value, both of uh, buildings and land. And real market value is uh, annually updated uh, for properties based on market trends. Um, but we're also gonna look at a second uh, methodology based on taxable assessed value. And a taxable assessed value is kind of the cut and cap version of market value that was implemented in 96-97 uh, with measure 50 and is uh, capped at 3% growth per year. So the city auditor released a report that is uh, included in the attachment to your report. And I'm gonna summarize that just briefly here. The report uses real market value in five URAs compared to several control areas outside of the current URAs between 1996 and 2010. So the report concluded that real estate values, that's land and uh, building values combined, increased almost twice as much as in other parts of the city, growing at uh, about 241% between 1996 and 2010. But the report also looked at a couple other um, uh, items. It looked at employment and wages in those areas. And despite the study period ending uh, in 2010, which was the low point of the National Recession, the total private employment was 18% higher than 1996. And that's definitely better than the 10% decline that was observed in the rest of the city. And then the, the other item, the last item, was wages. Uh, wages paid by jobs in your A's increased 29% compared to 15% in the rest of the city. And that indicated that URAs were adding higher pay, paying jobs in the rest of the city. Um, so we've taken a look at how taxable assessed value has changed between 2001 and 2012. We've been using this metric for a number of years in our reporting. Uh, this is real property assessed value per acre, so it's looking only at the improvement value that's being added. It doesn't take into account the land, so it's, it's looking at what's being added to the tax roll. Um, and we're averaging it by acre here to take out the impact of uh, your A size. So I'm going to run through a few slides that demonstrate the growth. So as shown by this chart, since 2001, assessed value has increased about 51% in areas outside of your A's, or about 4.7% per year, which is only about a percent, 1.7% uh, above the normal 3% rate of growth on um, taxable assessed value that's allowed for existing properties. So however, during the same period, real property assessed value has increased 88% on, aver uh, on average. And as shown, the highest growth occurred in the River District at 274% since 2001, and North Macadam at 358%, where there's been a rapid transformation in building over that time period. In the more mature districts, such as downtown Waterfront, and South Park Blocks, and Oregon Convention Center, uh, they've experienced a lower rate of growth. However, these dis districts had a substantial base to begin with and uh, growth that occurred through the 80s and 90s that uh, were part of that base. And the central east side is a lower uh, rate of growth, but most of that area is included in the industrial sanctuary. The neighborhood URAs have demonstrated slower growth, largely due to the residential nature of the district. However, in the case of Linton Interstate, um, that's somewhat skewed by the large starting base of the district. So in the next slide, you'll see that there is actually a lot of value being that was added over that time, uh, time period, just a uh, lower rate of growth. And finally, uh, Willamette Industrial has experienced negative growth over that time period as a, it's largely related to the predominance of industrial property that has been decreasing in taxable assessed value as market values fall. 
However, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been growth um, in the last two years. So we're seeing a, a little bit of growth there coming back. Any questions on this slide before I move on? I'll just go back for a second. Sure. The other thing that I think came out in the discussions in, in particular with Central East Side is the industrial sanctuary there, which is something that is fully supported at, by the neighborhood and by city council and by this commission as well, kind of gets in the way of the kind of growth that you would probably be seeing in that, in that neighborhood. Thank you. So this chart shows, um, as described in the prior chart, uh, higher growth rates in River District North McAdam, creating a substantial amount of new real property value being added. You can see $1.4 billion being added in River District and $600 million for North McAdam. Uh, the greatest amount of real property assessed value was created in River District. Um, but however, you can also see here in Lentz and Interstate that uh, there's been a substantial amount of value being created as well, uh, almost a billion dollars in Interstate and uh, $500 million in Lentz in this graph. And to sum it up here, um, total real property assessed value has increased about $17.7 billion citywide since 2001. However, uh, with only 11 and 14% of the acreage in the city, URAs have accounted for 31% of, or $5.5 billion of that total growth here. So it's a substantial portion of the growth in a small amount of the city, relatively. And finally, these two charts show the growth in real property per acre over time. Here you can see that the uh, per acre real property value grew 88%, or $1.1 million on an acreage basis since 2001, while citywide it has grown 51%. Any questions here? If someone was a, a doubter and they wanted to challenge the clear value of PDC investment, what else would we point to to say, well, the value, if it wasn't PDC and the related investments of PDC, the increase in value is likely attributable to X. Would there be one or two things that you would name? Well, there's... Um... Correct answer is no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm curious because I, I know there are always going to be those who say, well, it wasn't going to happen anyway. or. Right. You know, it, it might have been one of the contributors, but there are two or three other things. Are there any obvious things that you can think of that would have created this difference in value appreciation, uh, ignoring PDC? Well, looking at some of the, the, the examples we looked at with River District and North McAdam, there's, there's clear um, indication there that the involvement, the investment up front started that. The value. I, I would say the, the, the range of types of neighborhoods that we're talking about here, um, and what's nice is this was done by the city auditor, it wasn't done by us, yeah. and, and they're the ones that picked the, who to compare it to and pulled the city averages together. But you have uh, Lentz and Gateway, which yes, they grew slower, but they grew. Uh, you have Airport Way, which grew un, you know, from left, from less than 200 million in value to 1.2 billion, and this year 1.3 billion in value. Um, I think that shows a consistency to me, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this out. I, I think that this shows that that uh, urban development districts work. You know, the bad news is it's such, sometimes we sit back and say, gosh, we're stuck with these things because you've got to make the assessments within the boundaries, but by being forced to do that, you have a way to analyze, you know, was the economy actually bettered in that district? And especially as compared to what goes on everywhere else. And, and to me, the again, he, it's on page seven of the audit, and Tony brought it up to begin with, total private sector jobs in the Eurox plus 18% versus a citywide average of minus 10. I mean, that's significant. Average wages up 29 versus up 15. Market value up 241% versus 118. 
and building land value up 73% versus a neg negative 18. None of those, I mean, I think those are all statistically significant numbers. I guess the thing I would add is, is the, you know, the audit does have control areas as opposed to just the rest of the city or the citywide average. We, I mean, I think it is fair to say that, that urban renewal does cherry pick certain parts of the city, particularly central city, but because it's, and so you would expect some, some growth and assessed value over the citywide average to begin with, but compared to the control groups, they found this, a significant difference as well. So, so I think that was the purpose of the audit was really to see if, we, if they could isolate the impact of urban renewal separating out, you know, the fact that we were already downtown, uh, and, you know, and I think, I think you can see the results, the results there. Any, Steve? No, I mean, you ought to make EDC bigger and greater. We're doing a great job. We should do more of it, so. Aneshka? I mean, I think it was, okay, there we go. Uh, I think it was a really good report. It was, it definitely, just the fact that we got the, you know, that it was a positive report on behalf of the city and that showed that, you know, the contributions that PDC made actually did have a, an, a, an effect on the overall city's um, economic growth, I think is is really positive and great. Obviously, and, and Chair Andrews kind of explained, it is, you definitely see there's a larger discrepancy in some areas than, than in others. And, you know, I think that's where we, we get some of our criticism, you know, some of the areas like Central East Side and, and Gateway obviously haven't had some of the great opportunities that other districts have, so. Thank you. John? Well, it's an interesting uh, report, and I think I'll just let the facts speak for themselves. It's good to see. Thank you. There was, uh, I'll point out, there was a revised uh, page one to the board packet, and there was just a typo on the second page, but a fairly significant one, um, uh, three paragraphs from the bottom. It, it, it's, it talked about over the same time period combined, URAAV increased by 8%. It should have said 88%, so it's, it's been corrected for the record. Great, any more questions for Tony? If not, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll move on to the last item, which is also an information item, analysis of early defeasance of urban renewal areas. Um, I guess let me start by talking about why we're taking a look at this. Um, and it really came out of our budget discussions with the mayor and city council. Uh, and the mayor actually um, on the campaign trail talked about taking a hard look at PDC and um, trying to reduce the amount of debt that is, uh, uh, that the city is, is providing and uh, some of the commissioners got even to more uh, got into more detail as as we were going through the budget. So this is this is not something that the way it's being presented is even close to being complicated. You know, nobody's really thinking about absolutely shutting PDC down, which is one of the scenarios you see. But we had to pick. You know, there was no way to pick an in between scenario. So this. This would this this is not something that we're actually seeing city council saying we're seriously considering this. What we are seeing is we want to see what this looks like. We want to see what would happen if we stopped issuing debt on a district by district basis, and we like to see what kind of what that results in the in the future in terms of uh, assessed value growth and potential property taxes and. Um, so it's been a difficult, but I actually think a very, very good analysis. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think it helps as we, as we move forward in the conversation to everybody at the same level of information, the folks here at PDC, but particularly people like Faye, our CFO, and, and Tony who live with us, and the folks in the debt management team at, at OMF, they, they really have a deep understanding of this, but but uh, I, I don't think it's, it's widely shared. It's because it's, it, it really gets into the, to the weeds. And so we wanted to make sure that as the conversation became much broader, that everybody was operating from the same base of information because it is a complicated topic and, and, and it's not all, always intuitive. So, so this was probably one of the main purposes of preparing this was so that everybody had a clear understanding and then we can now have a conversation going forward and we wanted to share it with the board since we're sharing it with everybody at city council as well. I also, uh, 
a, one of the reporters called me as we were going through the process of presenting to city council and as we have presented to you and our staff what our future funding curve looks like and why we're having to reduce the staff size and why we're going through these difficulties. And he said, oh, come on, you're, you're making a big deal out of something um, that it, it's not that bad. Tell me it's not really that bad. And I'm going, no, <laughs> we're telling you the facts. It's, it's that bad if you want to characterize it that way. And this shows you why. I mean, absolutely. So I won't spend a lot of time on the intro since um, Chair Andrews and Patrick covered it, but um, good afternoon, Chair Andrews, Commissioners, Executive Director of Quinton. My name is Faye Brown, and I'm PDC's Chief Financial Officer. Uh, PDC staff work closely with the City's Office of Management and Finance Debt Management Office uh, to prepare this analysis, which examines impacts to the City General Fund and the level of investment <clears throat> that would be foregone under, pardon me, <clears throat> the early defeasance of urban renewal bonds. The analysis also examines the dynamics of starting new urban renewal areas or expanding existing areas as relates to the timing and the access to tax increment funds. And so um, we'll step through the report that we are providing, have been providing to the city council and the mayor. The first few slides provide just an overview, and, and you as PDC's board are well aware of these, but it's um, key to uh, starting a discussion about how urban renewal works in general to understand the analysis. And so um, this slide just reminds us that when an urban renewal area is formed, the boundary is drawn, drawn around a geographic area. The frozen base um, is what that uh, talks about is it talks about the taxable assessed value in that geographic area at the time the urban renewal area is formed. And so as the AV in the uh, assessed valuation in the urban renewal area grows, a tax rate is applied to the frozen base and those taxes go to the taxing jurisdiction. And the taxes that apply to the incremental assessed value or the growth in the urban renewal area is what generates the taxes that come to PDC. Um, the, so the tax rate that's applied comes from the taxing jurisdictions uh, in, in the city. And um, in particular, this slide shows you that the tax increment revenue is generated by the tax rates of um, our governmental partners in the area. 70% of the tax revenues that come to PDC come from the permanent rates and um, uh, it's 25% from local option levies, about 5% from bond levies. Uh, you can see that the largest uh, share of our permanent rate uh, comes from about 21% of that is the city's permanent rate generating our revenues and about 20% is the county and about another 20% is uh, from the taxes that go to the state school fund from Portland Public Schools permanent rate. Understanding uh, the ability to form new urban renewal areas or how much urban renewal area uh, can exist within the city, it's fundamental to understand that there is a cap, a statutory cap, and that cap is 15%. Only 15% of the acreage in the city can be in urban renewal areas. Uh, we're currently at 13,225 acres, which makes up about 14.2% of the acreage in the city. We have about 700 acres remaining that could go into urban renewal. Um, but this chart also shows you how the existing urban renewal acreage is divided up among the, the urban renewal areas. And you can see that there's quite a bit of um, uh, variety in the size of our urban renewal areas, with the largest being interstate corridor at almost 4,000 acres, and the smallest being South, South Park blocks at 97 acres. I think the most important piece of this slide for you to remember as we move on is um, we, we talk about the, the land value, the density of value, and there's a map later on that shows it, but to create um, enough TIF revenue in the neighborhood districts, the interstate, the Lentz Town Center, uh, in, in particular, um, it took a lot of acreage, whereas downtown, where uh, the property values are higher, you can create a base TIF and an increase in TIF much quicker with a smaller amount of property. So 
So the, the way that PDC accesses tax increment revenues is by issuing tax increment financing debt. The statute actually does not allow us to use the tax increment revenues directly on projects. Um, PDC, it, working with the debt management office, issues three types of debt. Du jour debt is pay as you go for us. It's the closest we come to using the tax revenues directly. We do an overnight borrowing. It's the least expensive form of debt um, that we can issue. About half of the debt issued over the life of an urban renewal area ends up being in the form of du jour. We also do line of credit borrowings, which we use to fund projects in the early years of urban renewal areas, or to consolidate borrowing until it's cost effective to issue long-term bonds. And then, of course, the long-term bonds are issued to retire the lines of credit. And occasionally, if we have a project that we know is eminent and, and it we're with certainty it's going to be going forward, we may actually issue to receive new money for that project. Gateway, Willamette Industrial, Education, URA, and MPIs, uh, the Neighborhood Pro Prosperity Initiative, uh, urban renewal areas are the only uh, urban renewal areas that do not have outstanding long-term debt. So this chart shows the maximum indebtedness of all of, of each of the urban renewal areas. And um, the, the bar, the total bar that you see there is the total maximum indebtedness. The black represents the debt issue to date. And the gray represents the debt that we're projecting to issue. The white represents uh, the maximum indebtedness that we're currently modeling that we will not um, be able to access in the form of debt simply because we don't have the tax revenue growth in those areas to be able to get to our maximum indebtedness. So two quick points. One uh, on the last slide. Um, the cost of actually issue, issuing bonds is fairly high. And so we need to do 25 to $30 million as a minimum. And that's, that's a fairly big, big sum, obviously. Um, the second is, as we do our budgeting every year, as you know, uh, one of the things that we learn is what OMF and our staff have now projected in terms of what the TIF resources are going to be available uh, going forward. And a couple years ago, I remember we lost 26 or 27 million in one year because the economy having fallen off, OMF was taking a more conservative view of what the future would look like in assessed value. This year, it's come back a little bit, but that, those numbers are, are very carefully looked at on an annual basis. Uh, obviously, you never want to be in a situation where you've issued a bond and you don't have the revenue to cover it. So they change from year, they, do they, does this graph change? The white and the, 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 white, gray, and the, the white and gray point do, uh, yeah. Right. And, and of course and, the black do. And strong. I think it's important to point out that in certain cases, the investments that we make can actually change what that bar looks like. So for example, if we were to do, um, a, if, if a large uh, project would develop in North Macadam, mm -hmm. say for example, if the Zidel property were to build out and all of that would be taxable uh, development that would come online fairly soon, then of course the increment would grow faster and then uh, we might be able to access more of the maximum indebtedness because the tax revenues would be there. When we model uh, for purposes of budgeting and forecasting, um, working with the debt management office, we were fairly conservative in that model because we know that the bond market um, will want to see a certain tax revenue coverage rate to, to pay the bondholders. So basically when you're looking, for example, at the North Macadam, it doesn't anticipate new sp projects. Right. Anything that's speculative, they're not going to make a guess, oh gosh, this is going to happen and we're going to collect more taxes. They're just taking a look at the existing tax base and increasing it, and where they know there is projects, they will add them. So then here is the table that we created uh, with working with the Debt Management Office to summarize the estimated bond repayment dates under the two scenarios that we talked about. So the way this table works is if you look at the date in the far left column, that's actually the last day to issue debt for each of those urban renewal areas. If you look at the middle column, that's currently what we're estimating um, as the defeasance state based on the bonds that we assume will issue over the remaining life of each of these urban renewal areas or the debt that we will issue. 
And then when asked uh, by the city council and the mayor to come up with the earliest possible defeasance state, what we did was assume that beginning in the year 1415, uh, uh, PDC would no longer receive any tax increment financing proceeds or tax revenues. Um, the, instead, those revenues would be held by the debt management office to put into a fund to early defease the bonds. And so if, if for example, all of these urban renewal areas uh, <clears throat> were to be early defeased, here are the, here are the dates that you would be looking at. And the difference between the far left and the middle column tells you how much earlier you could defeat those bonds by doing that. Uh, we separated the option three districts, Airport Way, Downtown Waterfront, Convention Center, and South Park blocks on the bottom because they've issued their last remaining debt already and, and there's no opportunity to early defeat those bonds. <coughs> this is the same information and it's just presented graphically and it just, uh, it, 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 sometimes it's a little bit easier to see it in the form of a graph than it is in a table. But you can see if you look down at the, um, at the bottom of the graph, the urban renewal areas that have the most ability to early defeat and have a substantial difference are at the very bottom, the education urban renewal area. Um, Willamette Industrial and uh, the MPIs. And then up at the top are the option three districts where, where the, the um, dark blue and the gray bar is exactly the same because we essentially cannot defeat any earlier than what we're, we're already planning. So as Chair Andrews said, we, we have not heard, nor are we assuming, that anybody is planning to early defeat all of the bonds for all of the urban renewal areas or doing anything quite as drastic, drastic as that far right column um, would indicate. But, um, but we thought that we would go ahead and provide the city council and the mayor with some information about what would be the impact if that were to be the case. And uh, so this this chart actually shows you the reduced investment in projects and initiatives by urban renewal area, but most notably we separated affordable housing and support for housing nonprofits um, up at the top because that would have the largest impact at almost $150 million. River District, about $111 million. North Macadam, $27 million. Interstate Gateway and Lake Lens, $98 million. Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative, $6 million. Central East Side, $8 million. And the Education Urban Renewal Area, $122 million of foregone investments. So there's also an impact to the two agencies that do those projects. Up at the top, we show um, information that the board is very familiar with which is uh, the staffing that we have in 1314 and then the planned staff reduction in beginning in 1415 to go to a staff of 95. The next table down shows you that if we were to do the early defeasance of all of the urban renewal bonds, we would reduce to a staff of 21 and that would be the only uh, remaining um, to, revenues available to PDC without issuing any more tax increment financing debt. PHB has about 21 staff dedicated to tax increment finance projects, and so they essentially would eliminate all 21 staff. So the impact of early bond repayments to the city general fund is an important part of the conversation. And so this chart takes a look at, again, all of the urban renewal areas, and it looks at the early defeasance scenario and compares it to um, the current, uh, our current modeling, which goes beyond the five-year forecast of what we would be able to invest in projects to be able to show the foregone revenues for projects, um, but what you would gain in uh, near-term general fund revenues. And so the area in B, uh, essentially is the total city fund, city general fund revenues from the frozen base and incremental AV that would be released after early defeasance. And B um, is equal to about $132 million for 10 years starting in fiscal year 1819. So, so if you did the early defeasance scenario that we showed in that table, you wouldn't start to see any benefit until around 1819. 
and it would be equal to that um, 132 million for 10 years. Um, a, the bars that go down below would be the foregone investments, and A is about 591 million, a present value of about $500 million. And C would be after you, if you were to make those investments in those projects and grow the increment for longer than the early defeasance would allow you to do, C represents the additional growth that you could experience in the city general fund by essentially continuing on the course that we're on. And the, um, and the C value is 428 million for 20 years, starting in fiscal year 28, 29. So it's a very simple graph, it, it simplifies it, but it, it shows, um, it, it's an easy way to look at the impact of early defeasance um, on the general fund and then also on foregone investments. Can I just, I just was going to add a couple of things on this. I think this is one of the reasons why these two presentations are uh, being made back to back. The, the general fund assumptions, particularly the impact of the investments that we would make with TIF on general fund, um, it, it's based on assumptions that we have. We have actually the data, we have the realized experience from our work, uh, our historical work that, that, that was in Tony's presentation, so we can make assumptions about what the impact would be on the, on the general fund from from continuing to make investments with available TIF. And then the second thing is obviously this is the this is the big picture look across all URAs and but the analysis can also be done on a URA by URA basis and and um, you know that's where I, we think this conversation will likely go next. So as Chair Andrews was pointing out when we looked at the acreage table one of the reasons that some of the neighborhood urban renewal areas uh, was created with uh, larger amounts of acreage was so that you could produce enough tax revenues that you could make significant investments in the urban renewal area. One of the things that drives how much tax revenue is generated is the concentration of value in the acreage within the urban renewal area. And this map is just a simple way of looking at where the highest value is in the city. The dark blue represents the central city. In particular, the highest values are just west of the river in the central city. And then you can see going out toward the, um, the, the neighborhoods and further away from central, central city, the, values, the value per acre is significantly lower. And so why does that matter? So we took a look at growth trends of tax increment revenues. Um, we looked at River District, Interstate, Gateway, Lentz, and North Macadam. And what we tried to do is normalize this by taking out the factor um, that has to do with how many acres are in the urban renewal area so that we can be looking at information that's comparable. And so what we did was we charted for the inception, so the, the beginning of the urban renewal area to year 11, for each of these urban renewal areas, we looked at the median annual tax increment revenue per 100 acres. And we looked at how um, the, the different urban renewal areas grew tax increment revenues. And, and what this points out is that if you have higher values to begin with, then that incremental growth um, will provide you with more tax revenues to produce, even if you have the same percentage growth across the different urban renewal areas. So this is just a summary. It takes several years before incremental AV growth produces significant revenues. Tax increment revenues vary widely based on the URA. And, and then this is a final point that's important to keep in mind. The environment for urban renewal has changed. And so recent changes to ORS 457, um, it reduces how much tax increment revenue can be gained by forming new urban renewal areas. Um, you're all well aware of revenue sharing, and of course we're already experiencing that in River District and, and Will in the education urban renewal area. And then House Bill 2632, if passed, will exclude local option levies from urban renewal taxes. And if you remember the tax rate chart, um, that was um, you know, a, a material amount of revenues that we received, lower than permanent rate, but still revenue that in the past we've been able to receive for urban renewal um, uh, investments. And, and that's it. Anything else, Patrick?
No, I, the last couple slides, I just, I just, I think just to reiterate, it's there really, there's been two parts to the conversation. There's been kind of the conversation on what, what the general fund foregoes by having urban renewal, and the second part of the conversation has been what could you do if you created, if you had the, the room to create new urban renewal areas, and why those are all options. That it's, it's just important to remind people how you, uh, you go about growing resources within new urban renewal areas, N not only have the rules changed as, as Faye just summarized there, but um, aside from a few areas where there's just mm. a high density of assessed value, you, it takes a very long time to create even modest pots of money. And so, you know, we, we are, you know, we're on the, you know, past the peak of a period of time in which which we, we created our renewal areas and we and the time passed and we built up these resources um, and, uh, to recreate another time like this that you really would have to, you'd have to let another 10, 20 years elapse. I mean, that's that's kind of the, the, the situation we're in, which does dovetail with our all of our resource development conversations. Um, once again, still possible to create new urban renewal areas, but they don't create resources overnight. Big time. Um, the last point that I'll make before I let you guys ask questions is in our, in the financial statements that we just got, I mean, there is no practical way that you could just shut the agency down anyway. I mean, we own about $90 million worth of loans and grants, and what are there, maybe 200 of those total? It's it's about 90 million in property and 90, it's, 80-something million in Well, 87 in, in property estate. and then uh, almost 90 in loans, eight, 57 of those that are real loans and not grants. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, we've been in business for 50 years. There are a whole bunch of transactions that are, aren't going to wind themselves up if we close the door. I mean, that, that just doesn't happen. And frankly, they're finding that out in California you know, as we speak. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Very complicated. Um, Charles? Yeah, great information. I said this in the briefing. A couple questions I have. I don't know what level of discussion Chair Andrews, you and uh, Patrick may have had with Council. Is, is there any debate regarding the value of PDC and the investment process uh, that has occurred at PDC over the years? I mean, is there a question mark? I don't think anyone? that's an active. I mean, I don't think that's an active conversation. It, it certainly might, might become part of the conversation as the mayor looks. You know, gets spends more time thinking about the future of urban renewal and and, mm -hmm. and the direction of PDC, which he you know has promised to do um, soon. So it, you know that 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 might be a question. But I don't I don't you know I don't think anything that's been brought to, up to date is 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 anti-PDC or, or, or people aren't recognizing the value of the investments that have been made. I think okay. there's, it's just the, really more about the trade-offs. Yeah, and, and that's where I was gonna go. Having urban renewal, right. And I was hoping that was your answer uh, because I was gonna go to the next step and say, well, the trade-off is you slow it down and shut it down, and I know that's not realistic, but you slow it down and you put the investment elsewhere how do they make the decision regarding the value of the return on that investment, i.e. putting it elsewhere versus what we're getting out of PDC? Because when you look at increases in value, you look at jobs, the information that you just went through, Chair Andrews, how are they gonna measure that? Or how is, is Mayor Hales or anyone talking about Yeah, once about again, I, I don't think the conversation really hasn't started. So I, you know, it, when we get into that piece of it, it, it would be a conversation not, not, not just with me or the chair, with I think the board, would be part of that and probably uh, uh, lots of different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, you know, the environment and and it's to be expected, um, um, even though we can't solve this, but the, the general, we're in an environment right now immediately in which there's a general fund shortfall. So general fund feels like the most precious dollars mm -hmm. that you can find. And as you can see, you know, general fund dollars get diverted to urban renewal as well as, you know, dollars from the county and other things. So I think it's a natural tendency to say, you know, gosh, is urban renewal com contributing to the predicament we're in? Um, you know, I, I think that's a debatable point, but, but I think as the presentation shows, there's nothing you can do with urban renewal that solves our current general fund problem. Mm -hmm. As much as may, someone, people might want to, this is, I think, more of a future-looking conversation. W you know, what is the right 
amount of investment to continue to make? Are there opportunities to shorten the, the, the time frame that we have, uh, you know, acreage in the city tied up under urban renewal? Do we want other urban renewal districts? I don't think that's an, I don't think that's off the table. I think it really is. It's a, it's a, you know, I think the mayor is, it's, I think he's honestly saying we need to, we need to take a look at it. It's, it, it doesn't need to be a, a negative perspective. It's take a look at it. Sure. And it sure seems like the story is so compelling with regard to the returns that, that the city has realized. Uh, and I hate to even say it out loud, but you, you almost get to the point where you look at a river district and you look at the return that's been generated and you ask yourself, can we figure out how to use that elsewhere? Well, the examples that we give over and over and over again, um, where my office building is, South Auditorium District, has been on the tax rolls for 25 years, and I, there, there's some outdated material. But since it was put on the tax rolls, that district alone has paid over a billion dollars in property taxes. Uh, Airport Way, it's not on the property taxes yet, but when it started, yeah. was worth less than right. two, $200 million. It's $1.3 billion today. And, and even a place like Gateway went from $600 million to $1.2 billion in that time frame. So um, it, it would be really academically wonder if, wonderful if you could go back and say, how much have we created? How much, have we, how much more are they collecting today because PDC was around and created this assessed value that they're collecting on that, that wouldn't have existed without it? Yeah. And I think it's been a while, you know, because it's been so long since we've had um, the, the urban renewal area, the area that we have on urban renewal return to the tax rolls, it, I do think there is there is this sense that it'll never happen. And, and so I do think there's power in thinking about how soon you could return acreage to the tax rolls to show that this is the model. The model isn't that, that, that these, this, these acres stay under urban renewal Forever, in, yeah. indefinitely. The model is that they get returned to the tax rolls it just hasn't happened much in recent memory, so I think it would be nice to be able to show examples where now urban. I think the option three are they're contributing to the to the taxes, but but something like Airport Way would be nice to get that back in the tax rolls and say, look, this it's done. The the work was done, and and here is the increment that's now flowing to not just the city but to the county and the other jurisdictions. So I think that's part of the problem is that there's people who don't believe that these properties will ever be returned to the tax rolls. Um, and we can't do it overnight, but I don't, I don't think anybody in this room, uh, you know, believes that we should keep these perpetually in urban renewal. I think we all agree they need to return to the tax rolls. We just, it's just not going to happen immediately. Steve? It's very interesting information. Um, I think some of the results are to show the great success of the PDC and how the strategic investments have really improve the value of those districts and improve the tax rolls. Uh, but it also shows that some of our less fortunate neighborhoods really don't have the funding available to make the strategic investments that need to be made to turn those neighborhoods around. So a couple questions. Um, what are the opportunities for um, making more significant investments in some of the communities where uh, your projections don't indicate that would be able to pay those off? Would would we not receive the, the bond ratings? Would we not be able to sell the bonds? Um, is there an opportunity to, to make a larger investment than some of the projections you've indicated here would allow us to? Well, one of the things to keep in mind um, when looking at some of the urban renewal areas that are not generating the same sort of growth that we saw in river districts, say, or even interstate, is that um, if we borrow on the line of credit, the general fund stands behind it. And so that's always a big decision for the city council to make, to allow us to borrow ahead of what the bond market is willing to let us issue in bonds. And so our bond issuing um, ability is what allows us to leverage the tax increment revenues. And the bond market these days seems to want Moody's, the rating agency, and even the underwriters seem to want to see um, 2.0 coverage, so twice as many tax revenue dollars than you'll have in principal and interest payments on the bonds. And so the only way to uh, utilize the tax revenues uh, more aggressively than we're doing right now would be to have the general fund stand behind it, essentially. 
and that's a bigger decision, a bigger discussion than PDC can have alone. I think the best answer to that is the, the more successful we are at creating new developments, the more money those developments, creating new taxable developments, because those projections in terms of what, the, the, what we're going to get to in the debt doesn't include any, quote, speculative investments. The city and the bond raters won't allow that. So in the, in the case, of, for example, of, of North McAdam, if we could actually build out the Zydell property in the next five years, the number that you saw up there would go up considerably based on the amount of assessed value that would create. Well, I just think we need to challenge ourselves as the board to find uh, innovative ways to bring additional funding to bear on some of these uh, more blighted areas, the ones that need more more help. So I think we th this should be part of our our uh, strategic meeting, uh, our retreat, when we um, find different different ways to provide creative funding. Because uh, let's take the success we've had in River Place and apply it to the other districts, especially those that need it more. Um, than, than some of the other ones that are that have, have done so well here lately. Commissioner Dixon, did the River District ever look like any of the of the other districts? I mean, because it seems like you know, without the successful districts, you know, it it doesn't have the same positive story. So, is I mean, how did they did they have other opportunities for bonding in, in an environment that was different than the people of, you know, that haven't seen that same kind of growth? I mean, I understand there are different parts of, of the city and the opportunities are different, but but I think Commissioner Strauss makes a really good point. How how can these other districts have a successful outcome with urban renewal? Or maybe think, that's just well. I, I think well, it's it's not an easy answer. I think the best example of where the city was willing to put the general fund behind um, borrowing to make large investments, with the expectation that it would eventually produce the, the revenues in order to eventually be able to issue bonds, take the general fund security away from the debt, and have the debt supported with tax revenues was in North Macadam. But even then, it was a very calculated and a very well thought out investment where we had a gap funding agreement with a developer that essentially said that if this development doesn't materialize, once we've put this $70 million into public infrastructure, then you're on the hook to provide the payment that we would need to be able to support the bond issue so that the general fund wouldn't take the risk. And so it was a very calculated risk. So short of another funding source, mm -hmm. that's probably what you're talking about, unless- Yeah, no, I, I, I think it comes back to the same answer. I think TIF is a, is a formula, and, and there's a certain uh, you know, way that it, that it works. So, so it, it's assessed value driven. I, 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 once you detach it from that, it's not really TIF anymore, it's something else. And as Faye mentioned, it is, you know, the city does have the ability to do that. I mean, and, and I think if you look at other investment areas, whether it be parks, when they talk about a parks bond or talk about some kind of bond to do transportation, that's a, that, that's a different, that's more what you're talking about, which is to take the borrowing power of the city or if it you know, goes to the voters, but, 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 and then to be able to take those resources and strategically invest them and it's not tied to uh, the assessed value in those particular areas, it's really based on need. That's not what TIF does, so, right. so the city, the city, can decide to do that, but that's, as Faye mentioned, that's a, that's a city council policy, you know, kind of higher level policy decision that they want to do that. And I know that when they talk about things like the need, of, need for parks in parts of the city, particularly East Portland, or the, the desire to, to pave streets that, you know, we have a lot of unpaved streets, th that, you know, the most common um, uh, responses on how we get there is, is to issue debt. And that's, that's the city putting its credit rating at risk to do to do that, and that's and that's the kind of decision that you're talking about. TIF is is far more formulaic than that. So it it really is. If the assessed value isn't there, you don't you don't magically create more resources. But I think Commissioner Schaus is right. We have to say set aside TIF. Are there other tools? If we just look at TIF, I don't think we're I think we're going to be stuck in the same box. Looking at other tools, we might we uh, in consultation obviously with the city council is we might be able to figure out other tools that can bring uh, resources to areas uh, 
to, to create the kind of, the, the, you know. Yeah, and if we do our job right, if we make those strategic investments, uh, we'll surprise ourselves with how the value of the properties do increase and that we will have an increase in, in TIF and we can, uh, you know, pay back those uh, funds that were given to us from other sources in different ways. So I, I realize that maybe the bond market won't accept it, but I, I've got faith in the future of our community. <laughs> well, and also, um, I, I just think that on uh, this, this graph, that's a really good uh, demonstration also in the, uh, the outcome of the general fund, number one, where the, you don't even see any kind of difference happening until 2017, and then that you're just steadily increasing only for about 10 years, and then it goes down. I mean, that's a really powerful uh, graph. I, I think that this presentation was full of lots of really um, eye-opening uh, information. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, very, very informative uh, presentation, and we actually just covered the topic I was going to bring up and second Commissioner Strauss's notion of alternative funding. I mean, that's that's what we have to figure out. Somehow, well, alternative funding. It, it, I look at the success in some areas and the lower level of success in other areas and I, I keep coming back to a large organization a large company that has some divisions that make more money than others and if you want the entire organization to grow and thrive you allocate and reallocate and I, I know what I'm saying is relating to statute but what we're really uh, doing right now is taking a position that this goes back on the rules because that's the fastest and cleanest way for funding to become available to the taxing agencies rather than recognizing you have a vehicle that generates significant returns, has generated significant returns and, you know, develops, redevelops and grows a city and at the same time could be used in a different way to fund other areas. I don't see that happening without some type of reallocation or some recommitment to what we do with the resources that this organization historically has been able to generate. I don't see it happening soon enough. That's just me. Uh, I just, I, I don't know how we get there. I know we're creative and we have a lot of smart people and we look for different revenue sources, but you already have an engine and what you're doing by default is saying we're willing, willing to shut down and slow down the engine. And I understand right now things have changed. You're not going to see the same type of increment growth that we've seen historically, uh, but it depends where we put those urban renewal areas because if you put them in the right area and you do it with a commitment that, well, if we get to resources at this level, we have a cushion of this much that can be reallocated to help areas that aren't growing at that rate, it sure seems like the only vehicle that I've seen that will do that or will allow us to do that, but it is a voter situation and we have enough of we know history to know how challenging that would be, but I don't see another engine that will do that for the city. Okay. Thank you for all your work and your help. Yep. Thanks. With these presentations. Uh, and with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>